so as far as your program coming online, when will it go into effect? So uh, currently we have 30 cameras that are deployed in the downtown Skid Row area, which was a part of our uh, pilot program. Uh, we have acquired eight, over 800 cameras that will be deployed uh, near the end of the summer. One of the key features that is often overlooked when looking at deploying cameras is the necessary infrastructure, uh, whether it's an internal system or a cloud system or the storage, and the bandwidth, the electricity, and especially if you have multiple police stations. Right now we have four stations that will um, be using these 800 cameras, and so doing that upgrades is taking a little time. Uh, ultimately, the goal and what has been funded in the mayor's budget is uh, sufficient money to purchase and maintain 7,000 cameras. Uh, our goal is to have those deployed by the end of 2016. So cost-wise, what are you looking at with that? So each camera is approximately $300 that comes with both a camera and a, a, a viewer. Um, three, three to four hundred dollars. I can't remember the exact amount. Um, the cost, and we are using uh, a taser device and also using cloud solution uh, known as evidence.com. That's approximately eighty-five dollars a month per device, and all of our devices are individually assigned to officers. We find that's important because there's no confusion about who had the device at a time, and also they tend to take care of it a little bit better. Um, and if you go to seven thousand, that's approximately seven million dollars a year in storage and maintenance costs. Um, the department chose to use a cloud storage for a variety of reasons, uh, including the fact that updates and, and other things are difficult for the department to have personnel use that. So we thought it was the most cost-effective way to go forward. But that's, of course, unique to every department. Mr. John Sawyer? Yeah, I probably have a little more personal question. Um, you mentioned that the first cameras or the first rollout will be in South L.A.? Um, actually, uh, what I was mentioning what? was that the digital in-car video is in South Los Angeles and South Bureau already, and it has been in the last five years. The body-worn video are going to be in four divisions. Um, give mission, me those. And, um, Newton, Mission, Newton, Mission, Central. So Newton, although it's in Central Bureau, is, is in part in South Los Angeles. Yes. Um, but once the 7,000 roll out, that will cover the entire... Um, uh, the entire area, actually every division in the city. Okay, so, but the fr one, the first one will be in Newton Division. That is correct. Okay. Yes, Thank and that should be online by the end of this uh, end of the summer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. I had a question regarding retention and storage policies. How are those come about, and what are where are they for the so, department? Certainly, um, the city of Los Angeles has a local ordinance that requires all public records to be maintained for five years, whether they're physical or otherwise. Uh, a few years ago, after storage became an issue with our digital in-car video, I mentioned 1.3 million recordings, um, we were able to, uh, the, the city council and the mayor signed into law a specific ordinance for LAPD of um, maintaining digital records for two years, um, and then they can be, uh, go through the process for destruction. The way that the department is doing it is that we will um, go ahead and, and, and destroy those recordings unless they are part of an ongoing investigation or they're required by law to be maintained over a period of time. And for the body worn, we're actually in the process working with the PPL to uh, come up with a business process to do that. That'll help minimize our costs over time. And also some video will, will no longer be necessary to maintain for any prosecution or civil liability. Mr. Lackey? Yes, I just have a quick question. When it comes to uh, forming this particular um, body-worn video procedure, this policy, was there a collaboration between the Officers Association and management in crafting this policy? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we had a working group with the Police Protective League early on when we did the test pilot uh, work together on coming up with a, a framework of a policy for those uh, 30 officers. And then uh, we had formal uh, meet and confer uh, over a period of a certain uh, number of months, and we worked and, and worked through all the issues. Um, and, and I have to say, I think you know, there are obviously going to be differences of opinion, different perspectives, but uh, we really focused in on what's the objective of this program and I think came up with good language together because it's very important. Uh, management, especially in a program that's so complex and large, shouldn't be imposing 
you know, the, the, it has to be something because the, where uh, labor and especially the officers, because they're the ones who are required to turn it on. They're the ones who are required to keep it maintained. And especially because I think the officers who we've deployed it to see the value of it and being able to record interactions uh, that will have greater compliance and, and I think a lot of enthusiasm once they're fully deployed. One last question. I noticed that uh, one of the objectives that you indicate in your policy is to assist officers with completing reports and providing testimony in court. Obviously, that is uh, an issue that's being evaluated very carefully, and there's not a, a meeting of the minds on that issue, but I find it interesting that it's one of the objectives of your policy. Yes, it, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up. That's certainly been an issue of a lot of robust discussion, both internally, externally, and, and I think in some ways a little bit of a confusion in terms of what's the objective of this program. The objective of this program is to collect evidence, evidence that can be used to give a complete picture, whether it's a prosecution of a, of a suspect or understanding what an officer did and why. Um, our objective is to make sure that uh, records are complete, that they're accurate, um, that they comply with all the existing law, that when they go and testify that they can adequately refresh the recollection. And therefore, just as an officer who is taking a report will often write notes about what somebody says, they should be able to look at that before they complete their report. And that would include video. We have five years of experience in this with digital in-car video. We have not encountered any problems with it. Um, and I know there's a lot of concerns, but I think when you think of the scope, and, and in particular this, this has been raised as an issue when an officer uses force, um, an officer involves shooting, et cetera. Um, if you look at it, uh, out of all types of force the LEPD has used, let's say last year, we had 1,300 incidents where an officer used everything from a firm grip or hold all the way up to a taser, and approximately 60 what we call categorical or more serious uses of force, including shootings. Um, it's difficult to say that all of those officers, which would probably amount because multiple officers in an incident, maybe 2,000 or more officers, um, shouldn't be allowed to see the video before they're making, um, you know, putting things down. I was a federal prosecutor for 10 years. Uh, we frequently had officers who were up on the stand or agents, and they're allowed to look at their reports, et cetera, refresh their recollection, testifying under oath. It was also important to, to make it clear this is not a surveillance program or a memory test of officers, especially after engaged in a life-threatening situation, maybe being shot at and nearly losing their life, using force, um, using a weapon. Um, and we have other pro processes and procedures to ensure the integrity of that kind of review. Officers are separated from others. They're kept um, away, they can't discuss the matter, um, and they can speak through their attorney. So they're, and it's a very controlled setting in an officer-involved shooting when they would be allowed to watch their video. Um, and I, as I'm sure uh, Lieutenant Lally can speak to uh, more directly than I can, um, it's a very traumatic event when a police officer goes through something like that, it's something I certainly have not experienced or could even imagine. And the idea that an officer was going to remember everything in crystal clear fashion about what happened during that kind of traumatic incident, um, I think is not, is not accurate. I don't know if you're saying. Any further questions? I want to thank you guys so much for coming up here from uh, Los Angeles. Just one more quick question. So ongoing costs are about $7 million a year? For the 7,000 cameras for full maintenance and equipment upgrades, et cetera. And that includes your storage? Yes. Ongoing yes. storage costs. And what about startup costs for your agency? The, the startup cost is the purchase of the, the equipment, so it's about $400 per uh, device. Um, and then it's a subscription uh, price for the storage and maintenance of it in the cloud of $85 a month. Uh, so it's a roughly about $1,000 per officer per year uh, in those costs. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. About a decade ago, the community and law enforcement were having a similar discussion about the transparency in law enforcement and its interaction with the public. As a law enforcement manager at the time, I vividly remember this discussion being around video surveillance of dash cams and how there was an overwhelming belief that dash cams would bring total transparency. As we move into the next topic of body-worn cameras, community, and law enforcement goals and objectives, I believe it's important to remember that the use of video surveillance can be effective, but as we have learned, it's not the panacea to improve relationships between the community and law enforcement. I believe the real answer lies in restoring community policing programs 
that integrate our law enforcement agencies into our neighborhoods. Body-worn camera technology like dash cams is a surveillance tool that simply expands current surveillance, techno surveillance technology. It is a real value as a deterrent, not only for the police, but for citizens interacting with them as well. I would like to now invite and welcome our second panel up today, uh, Jonathan Maligon, Senior Program Associate from PolicyLink, Edwin Perez, Legislative Advocate for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and Chauncey Smith, Racial Justice Advocate for the American Civil Liberties Union. Welcome, gentlemen. Greetings. Greetings, Chairman and members of the Select Committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Edwin Perez. I am the Legislative Advocate for the California NAACP. And on behalf of the 62 branches and youth units, we are in support of body cameras. Um, I think we could all agree that body cameras have a potential to help citizens as well as police officers. It could give community a sense of security when they interact with law enforcement. And body cameras can even dismiss inaccurate allegations against officers when they are met with uh, serious complaints. On the other hand, footage can also bring the truth to light when an incident of police misconduct has occurred. Because of the accuracy of police are the accuracy of police are often assumed to be correct. Body cameras are able to reveal a more precise account of the incident that took place. Now, although the Walter Scott incident was not captured on body camera footage, the occurrence that took place in April involved a white officer murdering an African-American man and the officer subsequently lying about the details of the shooting to cover himself. It's extremely concerning to think what would have happened if the incident was not caught on, on video. Nonetheless, what I find to be extremely valuable is that body camera footage and footage in general will just be able to give a better understanding of the discrimination in America and how law enforcement treats African Americans and people of color. During the Civil Rights Movement, the pictures captured provided the whole world with a look at the travesty happening in America. With the implementation of body cameras, America, as well as the rest of the world, will be given additional insight into the issues of the ongoing systemic racism and how it affects law enforcement and community relations. And hopefully, this sparks some serious debate about how we deal with law enforcement and community relations. Bettering the relations between African Americans and law enforcement will involve more than body cameras. It will require both groups of people to alter their mindset. It will, I believe law enforcement is taught and trained in a certain way that doesn't allow for the best interaction with our community. I think we, we first must develop a shared vision for the community that we live in and figure out the best way to reach that vision. Although that doesn't, ne that doesn't necessarily require body cameras, I do believe they will help in providing us with the information so that we may ultimately work with law enforcement and ensure that our community is a safe place to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chairman Cooper and the select committee members for hosting this hearing. My name is Jonathan Malagon. I am a senior associate with PolicyLink, a nonprofit based in Oakland, advancing social and economic equity. I also coordinate the Safety and Justice Policy Working Group for the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, a statewide collaborative of over 200 organizations focused on improving outcomes and, in and opportunities for the state's uh, boys and young men of color. My comments reflect what I've learned from many community leaders working on improving community police relations across the state. Over the past year, body-worn cameras for police has become a subject of public discourse and perhaps the most popular political response to recent incidents of police misconduct, including the non-indictments handed down to the officers involved in the killings of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and countless other people of color. Body-worn cameras have been advocated as one technological remedy towards fostering greater trust and transparency by providing what proponents hold is objective documentation of community police interactions. Yet there is much debate among community leaders and advocates about the effectiveness and desirability of body-worn cameras. Some communities and many elected officials believe that if properly regulated, body-worn cameras for police officers may be a tool for greater accountability and transparency by collecting evidence of police misconduct. Other leaders that we have spoken with believe that there are serious concerns regarding the retention, deletion, redaction, and storage of body camera footage. There are policy questions concerning when, where, and what to record, and whether police should be allowed to review footage prior to issuing a formal report. Furthermore, 
Some leaders believe that these policy questions miss, miss the larger context of an increasingly expensive architecture of surveillance, particularly as it pertains to low-income communities and communities of color. I would argue that communities must decide whether the potential benefits of body-worn cameras outweigh privacy and other concerns, such as police misuse. Additionally, and I'm happy that Chairman Cooper mentioned this earlier in the hearing, communities must be involved in the development of departmental protocols to shape when body cameras are mandated for use. If community members advocate for body cameras, the policy should include a community agreed upon provision outlining when cameras must be activated and a provision applying a presumption of police misconduct if footage is unavailable. That's why we have fully supported AB 256, authored by committee member John Sawyer, which would make it a felony for officers to alter or tamper with digital evidence. But perhaps more importantly, body cameras should not be the sole police reform accounted for. Body cameras should not be perceived as an end-all solution to fostering greater police accountability and oversight and mitigating officers' deadly use of force. Body camera mandates must be preceded or accompanied by additional policies that support a community-centered culture shift and increase accountability in police departments, such as the policy recommendations highlighted on our report, Building Momentum from the Ground Up, a Toolkit for Promoting Justice in Policing. Additionally, other sources of video footage, such as bystander cell phones, are potentially equally or perhaps even more valuable as they tend to capture police action not just the behavior of the person the camera is facing. Protections must be in place for civilians who record police behavior in, in public, and that's why we're also supporting SB 411, a LARA bill that protects the public's right to record police officers in public. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here, Chairman Cooper and the rest of the select committee. Uh, my name is Chauncey Smith. I'm a representative of the ACLU of California. We have over 100,000 members and supporters throughout the state, and um, we definitely have significant interest in the topic of this uh, hearing today, which is police body-worn cameras. Um, the ACLU's general position is that body-worn cameras can be a good tool of law enforcement if the proper, proper policies are put in place and if they're used appropriately to account for the various interests at stake, including the privacy interests of members of the public um, and also to uh, ensure that officers and members of the public are held accountable and also to account for the need for transparency when it comes to the issue of law enforcement and community relations. Um, in regards to the specific issue of accountability, uh, some of you have probably already heard, but research shows that the use of body-worn cameras, uh, if done properly, can uh, deter uh, misconduct by members of the public as well as officers. Uh, one example is the, the study in Rialto in which um, it showed that um, when body-worn cameras were used, officers were 50% less likely to use force and approximately 90% less likely to be the subject of a civilian complaint of uh, law enforcement misconduct. Um, one important policy issue uh, that the ACL, ACLU likes to advocate for is that um, before uh, rolling out body-worn cameras and allowing officers to use them. Um, there should be a robust and tra transparent public process that answers some of the critical questions in regards to why body-worn cameras are going to be used. For example, members of the public need to know why body-worn cameras are going to be used, how they will be used, and what safeguards will be put in place to ensure that they're used properly. Um, Having those basic uh, concepts in place, I'd like to touch upon a few key policy points that um, the select uh, committee should consider um, in moving forward with any type of recommendations or considerations in regard to body-worn cameras. One uh, is that there needs to be clear rules on when officers should record, right? Um, some departments or policy perspectives believe that body-worn cameras should be on all the time. However, uh, if you think about the, the interests of officers, right, sometimes they could be in their car or 
in a non-criminal interaction with one of their colleagues, and those aren't the type of things that you actually want to capture. And in that context, you would want to account for the privacy interests of officers and just allow them to have um, their own personal sense of dignity respected. Um, at the same time, once a criminal incident is about to commence, an officer should be required to record, uh, turn on their body-worn camera as soon as practicable um, upon the commencement of the incident in question. And that, uh, the purpose of that approach is to prevent editing on the fly. For example, if an officer walks up to a person, things can progress quite quickly, and an incident that uh, initially seemed harmless could all automatic, you know, could quickly turn into something that's controversial, and all of a sudden you miss part of the incident footage in question, and you ha only have part of the picture in question. Um, so for those reasons, we believe that um, there should be clear rules on when to record uh, for all officers before they start using them. In addition, um, randomized audits should be put in place to um, um, look at the body-worn camera footage um, for a couple of purposes. One, um, the footage can be used to develop training, see the uh, type of conduct that officers are engaging in, and to reform training so that they um, improve the way that they act, interact with members of the community. Three, uh, and this is a hot button issue that a lot of folks have uh, chimed in on so far as the issue of officer review of body worn uh, camera footage um, between the time of an incident and the completion of a police report. Our approach and recommendation is that officers should not be allowed to review body worn camera footage before making their initial statement uh, for a report if the incident in question is a critical incident, such as a serious use of force, um, or if there's a complaint of misconduct um, alleged against the officer. When I talk about serious use of force, I'm talking about shootings, um, you know, strikes to the head, someone gets hospitalized, and things of that nature. And as an example of this approach, the Oakland Police Department takes that uh, approach for all level one uses of force. And also, the LA uh, Sheriff's Department jail system recently installed video cameras in their jails and for serious use of force incidents, um, they adopt that policy. And the idea behind that is to prevent um, the appearance of impropriety or actual impropriety in regards to the statement that an officer makes in a report. You'd like to prevent the opportunity for an officer to tailor their statement to what the body-worn camera footage says and uh, even if they are inclined to tell the truth, um, because they are human beings, research and social science shows that um, the more post-event information that an officer comes into contact with, the more their initial recollection of the event uh, is, is changed. And it's going to become affected by whatever else they come into contact with in regards to the incident. Uh, fourth, um, to protect the integrity of the video footage, um, a policy should be put in place to preclude officers from altering or deleting video footage um, during the upload process or while it's being retained. And um, uh, lastly, it kind of relates to the initial uh, policy recommendation I put forth uh, earlier. Um, when an officer is going to interact with a member of public, they should provide the person that they're going to engage with with clear notice that they're being recorded as early as practicable. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, welcome questions. Any questions from the committee? Mr. Cork? Um, with regard to uh, Mr. Smith from the ACLU, uh, I'll just make a comment here, uh, which is you said that uh, for training purposes, people should be able to go back and look at the tapes. Um, I've had quite a few uh, representatives of uh, officer law enforcement rank and file who are very concerned about using those tapes to do gotchas on officers they don't like. Because frankly, um, you know, everybody makes mistakes, nobody's perfect. So there is a concern from the officers themselves that uh, these things be taken out of context. Uh, the question I have is should these things be public record? When we had an earlier he hearing dealing with, uh, partly with this issue, um, LA said, no, these aren't public record. Oakland said, Oakland attorney who is elected 
uh, also uh, said, uh, sure, these are public record. Um, what is the ACLU's position uh, with regard to public record and at the same time uh, protection of privacy? Um, yeah, thank you for those comments and uh, the question. Um, in regards to the first issue of randomized audits of footage to use for training purposes, um, I think the specific suggestion that I'm making is that it should be used solely for training and not to target any officers for making a mistake. They are human beings and um, the audit should be randomized and that's the essence of it, not to target any officer for wrongdoing. In addition, in regards to the public records issue, the ACLU's uh, viewpoint is that body-worn camera footage are public records. And in regards to privacy concerns, uh, which is a sub-issue, and their availability, uh, we believe that they should be particularly made available to the public when they concern um, critical incidents, analogous to the type of incidents that would um, give rise to precluding an officer to review the footage uh, before making their uh, statement for a report. Those include um, serious uses of force, complaint of misconduct, and things of that nature. The vast majority of footage um, wouldn't be of significant public value, and that's a different uh, situation that would have to be accounted for. Well, but th we have s there have requests been to departments for all video since 1776. This is clearly, for example, in L.A., where you've got over a million hours recorded, uh, would be a tremendous burden. How do you balance those? Um, I think one of the ways to balance that is to kind of account for what I just suggested prior, the type of footage that is of public value, and, and that is uh, the, the types of footage that is not. Just a quick question, and I think it's, it's, you know, I would like to see everybody with body cameras out there. So it's one of those things, use the carrot or the stick. And it's interesting, I know LAPD that was just here, they said they had in-car cameras for the last five years. And I know up in Northern California, uh, somebody's had them for over 15 years now, an in-car camera. So you have 15 years of that where the officers have, have reviewed their video. If you're, a, if you're a homicide or sexual assault investigator and you interview a suspect, in a room downtown, there's video, so you take notes during your interview and go back and review the video. If anything happens with storefronts or, say, someone's residence, there, there's video to review upon. So here you've had a long-standing tradition of, of reviewing the video to help write your report, because obviously we're human beings. We're not computers. Those folks aren't computers to memorize that. So, so how do you switch gears now where you've had a long-standing practice that's worked and in-car camera videos have been great. I mean, in, in some folks' minds, the bad actors are still going to be bad actors if the camera's rolling or not. So how do you, you know, fix the two when it's, when it's been a long-standing tradition and, and people expect that? Yeah. Now, that is a very difficult question and an po important policy to consideration to, to uh, think about. And I'd start off by saying you should question the, the policy in place in regards to reviewing the, the video footage and police cards before making a statement uh, concerning a critical incident. Uh, maybe that, maybe we need to rethink that and take a step back and see whether that's the best approach uh, that should be taken. And I think the example provided by Edwin from the NAACP earlier in regards to the Walter Scott shooting and the video footage that we saw from a random bystander and then the statement that was made in, re in regards to the incident was completely inconsistent with the video footage showed, shows that because officers are human beings and they're under significant pressure, there is, um, you know, things happen. Um, and, but in regards to the, the, um, the specific question, you know, this is a new technology and for hundreds of years in place, even you, could, you can say the past 15 years, they've been looking at uh, video footage, but before that, before they had any video footage, they were making their statements without the ability to look at any video footage in question. So since we're going into a totally new type of technology, um, you know, I think all of these, different approaches have to be thoroughly considered to take the best approach possible to balance not only the, the officer's interests in ensuring that they're accurate in what they report, but also upholding the integrity of the evidence gathering process to ensure that it is not uh, biased or corrupted in any way. And one more point I'd like to make in regards to this, um, the ACLU's perspective is not that um, any inconsistency between the officer's statement 
and the video should be used against an officer. Um, we, we don't think that's a, you know, the approach that should be taken. It's merely to ensure the integrity of the evidence gathering process. And, and I, I would encourage you to take a tour of some of the agencies here. I know locally, one of the departments here, for the in-car camera video, when they pull into the station at the end of the night, that video is uploaded automatically and stored on a server somewhere. So from just my tour of that facility um, and talking to those folks, their technology folks, it's pretty airtight where no one can go in and, and alter that video. So I just want to thank you guys for coming out here. And, and, and oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones Sawyer. Excuse me. Hi. Um, um, now, I, I've been a proponent of, of body cameras uh, for, for quite some time. And, uh, and I know there's been a lot of um, discussion um, about when you have shootings or there's some altercations. And we've, we've, we've gone on that for quite some time. And I'll kind of have a question on that. But just this whole concept of these millions and millions of hours and hours of tapes that we have, and we don't take advantage of using those hours as a training tool kind of disturbs me that, that, that um, it could be used as a punitive measure for the most part as opposed to as an opportunity to, to make better law enforcement officers. Um, and, and so I hope as we move through this um, that all of law enforcement and also the community um, will give um, managers uh, that are in law enforcement an opportunity um, to use these, this footage as, as not something to beat officers and law enforcement over the head, but as an opportunity for them to, to get better and improve. Um, as you know, you give a speech. When you give in front of the mirror, that's, and when you review later how you give a speech, you get better at it. Um, I would hope that as you sh start to interact with the public, um, people can come through, especially there, the supervisors can give them pointers on how to interact better so that they get better at it over a long period of time, especially if you're looking at a million hours worth of, worth of tapes just in LAPD alone. Hopefully 99% of that is about improving law enforcement, not 99% of it is looking at uh, what has happened uh, with some bad actors. The, the, and then part two is, and kind of, kind of my question, hopefully you heard LAPD and um, speak about their procedures, which they probably gave more about what happens when there's an unfortunate incident, especially a firearm, someone getting shot, someone getting killed. It, it appears to me there's, a, there's an unbelievable process that one law enforcement officer has to go through. It's not just write a report and it's over. Um, I, have a, I have a feeling from what I've heard today, and hopefully you heard, there's, there's not only internal affairs that you have to you have to be interviewed by probably several officers and command officers. It's not just write a report and then that becomes the sacred cow. There's a lot of interrogating that goes on with that. And, and um, for the first time, I got a feel for that. And I, and I have a feeling if we were to, um, without getting into an officer's um, um, bill of rights, but if we were to get into what is the actual process that an officer who has the unfortunate opportunity to discharge a weapon, what they go through. And if the public were to see how intense that investigation could be, um, do you think they might have a little more um, um, trust in the system that they're looking at now where allowing an officer to review the tape um, before they write a report? Um, knowing that they will go through some intense scrutiny if that happened, or is it because you, because your, your members, whether it's PolicyLink, NAACP, or, or ACLU, um, you think that the process now is not intense enough, um, that, that, the, that the body cameras will add a, a, a window to it? I mean, what, right now there's a, there is a process in place that does, doesn't seem to give you comfort that 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 will get to the truth and you're looking for body cameras to ultimately get there mm -hmm.